Hey everyone, welcome to another lesson. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about Japanese encephalitis virus. So we're gonna talk about how this virus causes encephalitis. We're also gonna talk about some of the signs and symptoms, the progression of this condition. We're also gonna talk about diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of this condition. So the Japanese encephalitis virus, or JEV, is a virus in the family, Flaviviridae. It is a flavivirus. So it is a positive sense, single-stranded RNA virus. And it was first discovered in Japan in 1935. That's where it got its name. And the other part of its name comes from the fact that this virus causes encephalitis or an inflammation of the brain parenchyma. We're gonna talk about what are the signs and symptoms of encephalitis in the next couple of slides. So although I'm saying JEV leads to encephalitis, actually only less than 1% of patients that are infected with this virus have neuroinvasive disease. So we'll talk a bit more about that a little later on as well. But nevertheless, the Japanese encephalitis virus is the number one cause of viral encephalitis in Asia. And it is the number one cause of childhood neurological infection and disability. So as you can see here, many of the Eastern Asian countries as Southeast Asia and Southern Asia are affected by this virus. And the World Health Organization or WHO estimates that there are 68,000 new cases of Japanese encephalitis each year. So it's not insignificant. So the transmission of JEV is as follows. So what happens generally is that the viral cycle of this virus occurs between pigs and wading birds. And the wading birds are herons and egrets. So pigs and things like herons. So a mosquito transmits the virus between each of these types of animal. And a lot of times we often see it in pigs where pigs have high viral loads of Japanese encephalitis virus. And what happens is humans are incidentally infected. Humans are end hosts, which means that if a human becomes infected, a mosquito doesn't just come along and bite a human and transmit that virus from one human to another human or from one human to another animal. It doesn't happen. Humans are the end hosts, which means the virus stops at that infected person. And the reason is, is that humans don't produce enough viral load for a mosquito to pick it up and transmit it to others. And the mosquitoes responsible for all of this are the Culex mosquitoes. So the Culex mosquitoes, particularly Culex vishnui, and these mosquitoes tend to bite people in the evening and overnight hours. And we often see these mosquitoes more prevalent in rice fields and marshes. So in those countries we talked about, these mosquitoes like to reside and are more prevalent in rice fields and marshes. So how does the Japanese encephalitis virus infect somebody? So a mosquito, a Culex mosquito that is supposed to transmit the virus to a pig or to a heron or egret ends up landing on a human and takes a blood meal. The virus leaves the saliva of the mosquito and enters into the person. And the virus enters into the person's blood. And that is viremia, virus in the blood. The virus can also enter into macrophages as well. And what can happen in some cases is that the virus can cross the blood-brain barrier and enter into the brain and cause infection there. And there are specific areas of the brain that are affected and damaged by the Japanese encephalitis virus. These include the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the midbrain, and the pons. So the basal ganglia, it's not really seen here, but the thalamus is affected. The midbrain can be affected in the pond, so a lot of these central areas of the brain. So what are some of the clinical features of Japanese encephalitis virus? First, the incubation period of the virus is five to 15 days. So when a mosquito bites someone, it takes about five to 15 days before we start to see symptoms. And like a lot of viral infections, there is a variable clinical presentation. So some people can be completely asymptomatic and some people can have encephalitis, have seizures, and even die from this condition. But if we do see symptoms, there is a certain progression of symptoms with the Japanese encephalitis virus. We first seem to get fever, and that fever moves on to gastrointestinal symptoms, and those gastrointestinal symptoms then progress into neurological symptoms. So we'll talk a bit more about that in detail here. So fever is the first clinical feature we see. We can also then see headaches, and then we move on to gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea and vomiting. We can also see diarrhea with this condition as well. We can see generalized weakness. This can all lead to progression of an acute encephalitis. So that is the neuroinvasive disease portion of this condition. The acute encephalitis is brain inflammation. Itis is inflammation. The prefix encephal means brain, brain inflammation. So brain inflammation is essentially a fever, 
a headache and altered mental status. And then some individuals can even have seizures. And the seizures seem to more likely happen in children and they can be generalized tonic-clonic seizures. So they can be essentially the classic seizure that you see someone falling to the ground and shaking all of their limbs. But some individuals can have even other subtle neurological symptoms. Other clinical features include Parkinsonian features. So some individuals can have Parkinsonian features like resting tremors and rigidity. So if you were to check someone's arms, you might see cogwheel rigidity. If you don't know what that is, please look that up and see what that looks like. With the Japanese encephalitis virus, you can also see asymmetric limb paralysis. So one side of the body can become paralyzed and the other side is completely fine. And what we generally see is that it usually occurs in the lower limbs. Other findings of this condition include a syndrome of inappropriate ADH or a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So it's an inappropriate increase or secretion of antidiuretic hormone. And that can lead to issues like hyponatremia. So you're retaining a lot of fluid and that fluid essentially dilutes out your sodium in your body, you get hyponatremia. Some of the complications of JEV are as follows. Fatality in patients with neuroinvasive disease is 20 to 30%. Again, the neuroinvasive disease is a small subset of patients, less than 1%. But if a patient does get the neuroinvasive disease, they have encephalitis, they get the seizures, fatality is quite high. And it a lot of times can be 20 to 30% of patients. Some patients can fall into a coma with this condition. And even if they survive and all of these symptoms resolve, they can have long lasting neurological symptoms. And it can be anywhere from a third to half of patients have long lasting neurological symptoms. And some of these long lasting neurological symptoms include upper and lower motor neuron weakness, cognitive impairment, speech impairment, and recurrent seizures, along with learning and behavioral problems. Again, a lot of these might be more likely to occur in a child who is infected with this. And there is some evidence that if the JEV virus infects a mother who is pregnant, that it increases the risk of miscarriage. So the Japanese encephalitis virus can infect a woman who's pregnant and it can cause a miscarriage or loss of the fetus. So how do we diagnose it and how do we treat JEV? The diagnosis usually occurs through serology. We look for Japanese encephalitis virus or JEV immunoglobulin M or IgM. Again, as I mentioned in my West Nile virus lesson, there is cross reactivity between the JEV IgM and the IgM against West Nile virus. So if a patient happened to be exposed to West Nile virus, they may look like they might have had JEV. There's some cross reactivity. So it's not a perfect separation between these two. We can also do imaging and specifically MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. And we can see brain lesions in those areas we talked about before, the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the midbrain, the pons. And the treatment of JEV is often a supportive one. This is a viral infection. There's no official antiviral treatment for this condition. It's a lot of times supportive and we help patients get through the condition. So we treat their symptoms. We try to maintain their hydration and we help them get through the condition and help them resolve this condition on their own. And prevention of JEV is through what I like to call mosquito hygiene. Mosquito hygiene is if you're in an endemic area with this virus, it's best to wear long sleeve shirts or long sleeve coats, try to cover up as much skin as possible. Also use insect repellent. And if you're sleeping outside, use a mosquito net. These can all help you reduce the risk of becoming infected with the Japanese encephalitis virus. And this helps prevent many, many different mosquito borne illnesses as well. So these are always good tips in order to help you stay healthy. And there's also a Japanese encephalitis vaccine as well. So this can also help prevent and reduce the likelihood of becoming infected with the Japanese encephalitis virus. So again, to recap, diagnosis of JEV is through serology, looking for JEV IgM. You can also do MRI imaging of the brain and see characteristic brain lesions. Treatment of JEV is supportive because this is a viral infection. We use supportive measures, so we wanna treat their symptoms and keep them hydrated. And prevention of JEV is the most important thing we can try to do. And that is through mosquito hygiene, as I mentioned before, some of those tips and tricks, and through the Japanese encephalitis vaccine, which can be given to help prevent 
JEV infection and the neurological sequelae that may occur after having this infection. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. And as always, continue to live, laugh, and learn, and I hope to see you next time.